Coach Rivera, I don't, Coach Rivera, I don't want to play with the kitty anymore. Riverboat Ron, you there? Coach Rivera? Ron? Ron? Stand the block, stand the block, pop and go, baby. Get up, get up, ten. Comes back inside five. Gets the ball across. Touchdown! Seahawks! What an opening round for the Seahawks. A 16-yard run. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Hawks Nest. Well, our Seahawks went back out on the road again, finishing up their road schedule, and again they conquered that dreaded 10 a.m. start time like it wasn't no thing. I know this team seems to be great at doing this. They got five wins at 10 a.m. this year, but in the past, it was horrific having a Seahawks team have to go out east. And it's not just Seattle that this has affected in the past, but any West Coast teams, when they have to usually go out to 10 a.m. games out on the East Coast, it's just not pretty. It's not fun to watch. They still look asleep. Not this Seahawks team, not this year's team. They were marvelous this year on the road, marvelous in that 10 a.m. start time. And they did exactly what you want a good team to do. As they came out, they got right up on the Panthers, a team who you know is looking to pack it in, who you know is, you know, look, they're not in the playoff picture anymore. Their starting quarterback's gone. They've got a backup in there. They're, they're ready to cancel it. But if you give a team like that a little bit of juice going on, you give them maybe a lead, you let them stay with you, they're going to start getting that energy rolling by the third and fourth quarter. And instead, they were playing from behind all day. This game never really felt out of Seattle's grasp. It always felt like we had this kind of firmly in hand. Granted, at the end, the Hawks had to do their traditional thing, which is make us all freak out and wonder, is this all just going to turn to crap now and switch all of a sudden? Have you guys snatched uh, a loss from the jaws of victory? But no, they settled it down. They hung in there. They they clamped it down. Russell did a little scramble on a third 11, got the first down, and we're all good. But more importantly, the biggest thing that happened was not just the Seahawks' victory. It was the San Francisco 49ers doing the 49er thing, which is losing at home to the Falcons, propelling the Seahawks seemingly inexplicably into that first seed of the NFC over the Saints who beat them, over anybody else, we now the Green Bay Packers, we now sit in that number one seat if we can just win out in the two games. Hell, there's even feasible scenarios where Seattle only has to win this game against the Cardinals and could still lose against the 49ers and still get that number one seed. And I know that I've been banging this drum since the start of this season saying that this is so important. And there's many of you out there that I know have spoken in the comment section about how confident you are about the Seahawks team having to go out on the road. But I'll tell you, having that home field advantage, being able to play those games at home is so huge. Pete Carroll has yet to lose at home in the playoffs as a CL Seahawks head coach. And if you want to look going even further back from the Chuck Knox days and the Mike Holmgren days, Holmgren lost in 2004 to the Rams, and I believe Chuck Knox lost to the Cincinnati Bengals in 88. But outside of that, I think that's pretty much it. You've had no other playoff losses at home in the Seattle Seahawks history. So to say that it's it's more than just a marginal advantage is a huge understatement. As well, you've got quarterbacks that change in how they play when they have to come play out in that open air stadium, especially in January when the winds are whipping, when the rain's falling. Who's, who's one guy that's going to be affected of this in the NFC? Drew Brees, a team that very feasibly could come to have to play us in the playoffs in the second or third round. And we saw this in 2013. When you get Drew Brees outside with winds whipping and the rain falling, he is a different quarterback, and he always has been. He just gets to benefit a lot of times from playing within a dome stadium and in great conditions in the South and outdoor stadiums in Tampa Bay and in Carolina. It helps. It makes it easier to throw for a quarterback. We've seen that with Russell when he's had to throw in those when he's been allowed to throw in those environments. So huge win for Seattle, but even more importantly, they get that coveted first seed potentially if we can just hold serve if they can just win out in the two games or even just at least take care of business against the cardinals and then maybe even get a little bit lucky huge win though thank you 49ers for losing thank you falcons you get two thumbs up for me Dynamic wide receiver Josh Gordon was suspended by the NFL this week for violating the substance abuse policy procedure laws, whatever the hell they call that. Seemingly now for, I think, the fourth or fifth time, I can't keep track with this kid. And I had this to say when we first signed him at the time. For me, this move's success is not going to come down to whether he can be good on the football field. If Gordon gets on the football field playing with Russell Wilson, even right out the gate, I have no doubts he'll be very good. 
where we got to watch and wonder is how he's doing throughout the week. So I like Josh. I knew on the football field, him and Russell would be <clears throat> match made in heaven. But off the field, I had to wonder, can he stay clean? Can he make it to the meetings? Is he going to full, show full effort in practice? That was where I thought the rubber would meet the road. And now he's been suspended. It does appear that this could be the end of his NFL career. And boy, your, your, your mind wanders. The imagination runs wild when you think about him being in the Seahawks program for a full off season and a training camp and being able to work with Russell down there in Mexico with their little camps and all that and how great that connection could have been as it comes up. It's all for naught now, it would seem, but he's a great player. Hopefully he still can get maybe one more chance. And if he does, I'd love to have him back here with Seattle because I think he's a perfect fit there for Russell. We'll just have to see how it goes. As this coin does turn over, the one interesting part of this to take a look at, though, is Antonio Brown. The Seahawks have shown interest in Antonio a couple times throughout this year. And one of the reasons Antonio hasn't been signed up until this point is it's an open sort of known secret out there that the NFL, as soon as Antonio gets signed, is going to put him on the uh, inactive list but paid. So he'll be suspended with pay. And so nobody wants to go out there and sign a guy you're just going to have to pay for nothing at that point. But from Seattle's standpoint, you have two weeks left of the season, and you could potentially get him in on a veteran minimum type deal for this two games. So if you're out $100,000, if the NFL has to, happens to suspend him or a couple hundred thousand, will it be maybe worth a worthwhile risk for the Seahawks management to take that flyer and see if the NFL does have the guts to do that? Because the NFL, you know, hasn't necessarily made a judgment or a determination on this yet. They may do something or they may not. And while there's many of you out there that may hate Antonio Brown, and I'm not sure that I want him in here, he looks like a huge head case, we cannot argue that his addition to that receiving core and what he could do, even on a short-term basis, would be potentially amazing. That's fine. Looks fire. Got a man open. It's broken. He's in. Touchdown, Seahawks. There's no two ways to slice it. The Quandre Diggs injury is going to hurt. He suffered a high ankle sprain in this game, and that can be an injury that takes anywhere from two to four to six to eight weeks to recover from, depending on the player. Luckily, he has had it in the past, and so that does tend, as Pete Carroll said, to allow a player to recover a little bit quicker from it. And we need this. We desperately need this because Quandre has changed the way that defense looks when he's out on the football field. You saw it instantaneously in that San Francisco 49er game when he caught an interception and returned it for a touchdown, but he was great throughout that game and laying hits and being good in coverage. And he's been good in seemingly every single game that he's played for us. A phenomenal pickup. So to lose him would be really bad at this point because it does look like Seahawks are really invested in throwing out Leno Hill rather than Marquise Blair out in that secondary if Diggs does go down, which is kind of a head scratcher because I didn't feel like Blair played badly in the game that he has played in this year and the times he has come into play. But Seahawks coaches seem to want to take their time with him and let him grow slowly and surely. So Hopefully Diggs can get back up on the football field here for the playoffs. We're desperately going to need him because right now, if defensively speaking, we're not getting sacks. We're still allowing yards on the in the air. We still cannot stop running backs on the ground. McCaffrey kind of had his way. The only really saving grace for the defense in stopping the run this year has been that the off opposing offenses have been just so dedicated towards wanting to throw the ball that they keep going away from the run even when it's working. Even if the team's getting five, six yards a carry with the running back, they'll seemingly still, oh, let's try to throw which has helped the Seahawks defense out, but it doesn't speak to how good the Seahawks defense is at stopping the run. Luckily, the one thing that's turned in this situation with this is the turnovers. Early on in the season, they weren't getting very many turnovers. If we got it, it seemingly was only on a tip ball that a receiver dropped and then landed into one of our defenders' hands. Now we're seeing fumbles. Now we're seeing the, uh, interceptions with players jumping routes. That can be the saving grace for this defense, even if they can't generate pressure, even if they do give up the yards. If they keep these opposing offenses to field goals, keep them out of the end zone, and they can get those occasional turnovers, the offense is pretty darn good about not turning the ball over itself. And then the postseason in a playoff game, that can be the difference in the game. There are statistics that show when you win the turnover battle, you usually win the game. And I'm sure those statistics further show that when you're in the playoffs and win the turnover battle, you really, really oftentimes win the game. Now he's going to throw over the middle. And ball is intercepted by Wagner at the 20-yard line. And he gets it out to the 25 before he is tackled. Bobby Wagner literally stole that ball away. 
If there's one area I hope the Seahawks go out and target this offseason, it's going to be to get pass rushers. They have a tremendous amount of cap space. We'll have a whole bunch of draft selections. So even if we can't necessarily go out in free agency to go get those pass rushers, i.e. a guy like Dante Fowler, we could go out and trade for one, i.e. like a Calais Campbell or a Vaughn Miller. I would be very much in favor of the latter situation because I think there'll be some of our own free agents that are going to be signed this offseason, which will allow us to get back into the compensatory draft pick game moving into next offseason if we don't sign free agents. So to make the trades would be a better situation from my standpoint because you can really pick over the better player that you can bring in at that point. But regardless of however they do it, we're going to need more than what we've got. LJ Collier has got, I think, one pressure throughout this whole season. Granted, you got this guy to be potentially really a run-stuffing defensive end, the four-tech defensive end in this scheme, who's basically was the Red Bryant role of yesteryear, right? Go out and just stop the run. That's your main. That's mainly what you're there to do. But as a first-round pick, he doesn't appear to be giving you any kind of pass rush ability, really. Yes, Rasheem Green showed a similar output last year, but also remember Rasheem Green flashed throughout the whole preseason. He showed you there was some pass rush ability there. He was a guy who was coming into the league at 20, 21 years old, so it was going to take him some time to kind of round into shape. I don't think we can say the same with LJ. I want to say he's a little bit of an older player. And so if you're counting on his development to take the next step forward, like Rasheem's taking the next step forward, I think you're counting on something that's not going to necessarily happen. We need to get legitimate pass rushers in here, guys that can push into that eight to 10 sack mark that can get the pressures. That's not what we're getting in this defense right now. Too often or not, every guy on that defensive line is getting neutralized. And thankfully, at times, we've not had to play against the, the upper echelon of quarterbacks. Rather than play, you know, uh, uh, Ben Roethlisberger, you get the backup, right? Rather than play Cam Newton, you get the backup. We've been able to benefit, same thing with the Falcons. The same Falcon team that just went and beat the 49ers on the road in San Francisco didn't have Matt Ryan for the game they played us. And Lord knows, Matt Schaub threw for 499 yards in that freaking game on his own. So it may have been potentially a loss if Matt Ryan had played in that game. Seattle has certainly benefited at times from having quarterbacks who couldn't really fully take advantage of the fact that the Seahawks pass rush is just woefully undermanned right now. Granted, we're going to get back Ziggy Ansaw this season and Clowney back and that there should be some invigoration there when those guys do at least come back into play. But they've got to spend a little bit more time this next offseason really hammering, bringing in legitimate guys and not young rookies that you're bringing in out of the draft who always are going to usually take a couple of years to develop, but legitimate pass rushers right out of the slot. You can always get these veteran guys out there who don't cost the bank, who you can bring them in, who can do the job. Let's do that. Let's go this route. If you're going to keep the simplified scheme with the 4-3 and the three linebackers, even when there's three wide receivers on the field, fine. You need guys that can get to the damn quarterback. And right now, we don't have that. Hands it to Carson. He's got a first down. He gets to the goal line. Does he get it? He does. Touchdown, Seahawks. Two wins. Two measly little wins. That's all the Seahawks need. And we can sew up that home field advantage throughout the playoffs in the first round bye. And the Cardinals are not going to be any kind of pushover coming into this game. I'd expect Kyler Murray to keep the Cardinals in this game as he has throughout the season. I think he's played outstanding football and team that's got a lot of holes. Certainly in my estimation, he's fulfilled that first round promise, that first overall draft status that he carries. In a lot of ways, to me, he is the closest thing that we've seen to Russell Wilson since Russell Wilson entered the league. He uses his legs well, but he uses it to extend plays and make throws down the football field just like Russell will. I think he's going to be a pain in our butt, a headache for years to come and I expect in this game when the Cardinals don't have a whole lot of else running for them they've got this working for them and as we've seen with Russell Wilson a single great quarterback can keep a team in a game almost single-handedly at times as well they've gotten their running game starting to round out a little bit and this is one of the concerning places for me with the Seahawks and the defensive side of the ball is the way that teams like the Rams with Gurley or the teams with uh, McCaffrey last week were able to run on them so easily granted these are upper level running backs that have run well on them the Nick Chubbs and whatnot and you're not always going to run into those type of running backs but Drake has really been coming on for the Cardinals he's a better fit I think than David Johnson who was a little bit bigger slower back I think they want the quicker uh, scootier guy in there in that spread formation that they like to run so he could be a problem Murray could be an issue there but I do fully expect the Seahawks to know what's ahead of them to know that what they can grasp and grab onto this week by potentially winning especially with it being at home because they ring that bell hard not only could they potentially be in position to get the first round by if they win next week they could potentially this week this week week not only get the first round by the division champ 
but get the home field advantage throughout the playoffs locked up this week with a win. It takes like 10 different scenarios, and I don't, you have to be like that Nash guy from that beautiful mind to work out all the calculations and mathematics, but there is a feasible scenario where that could occur. And how huge would that be for the Seattle Seahawks to have essentially two de facto weeks, two bye weeks almost, to be able to prepare their team fully? For that next playoff game, it would be absolutely huge, especially when you have a team that's nursing injuries to guys like Ziggy Ansah with his shoulder and Clowney with his abdominal injury and Quandre Diggs with his high ankle sprain and Bobby Wagner with his twisted ankle. And the list goes on and on and on and on. Giving those guys a couple weeks, you cannot understate it enough how huge that would be in freshening them up for those, that run of three games. So go out there, Seahawks, get this win this week, sew that thing up, get yourself in that catbird seat because you would be riding high and in prime position to get your butts back to the Super Bowl, which is what we all really want. Thank you as always for watching, commenting, liking, subscribing. All of these things help this channel continue to grow tremendously. We just passed 1,500 subscribers and going strong, and we're not even a year old as a channel. I appreciate all of you for that support. Thank you very much. There are a couple of you out there that I can see are, you know, you're forgetting one little thing, though. I can see it out there. Just there's one thing you're forgetting. Go Hawks.